Welcome everyone to the Summit on Mental Health, the last summit of the meeting conference. I'm Tim Yu, the IMPM student representative and session chair for this summit. Tim Tan will be the tech moderator for the summit. How can we expand mental health services beyond the medical model? That's the main question for the hour. This summit will feature Paul T.P. Wong of Trent University, Kirk J. Schneider of Saybrook University, Brooke Neem of University of Toronto, Brent Dean Robbins of Point Park University, and Martin Wong of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. There will be time for questions and answers, so if you have a question, please type it in the chat. Paul will now begin with an introduction. This will be our last summit symposium. And in a way, it wraps things up. The pandemic really exposes the inadequacy of our mental health system. We cannot have a mental health system completely based on a very expensive medical model. We really need to rethink how to improve our mental health at a grassroots level. We need to have a cultural, societal dialogue at all levels on how to make our society healthier. Okay. In fact, I propose to you that even before the pandemic, our society is already in a terrible mess. Paradoxically, lots of our problems are related to progress. Now, progress is a double-edged sword. Progress bringing many benefits. We live longer, we have to eat better, our income level, living condition is better. But we pay a heavy price for progress. The most obvious one is widening the income gap. The first top 1% owns more wealth that are lower 80%. Look what happened. Many of the crimes are committed by the very poor. Dire poverty drive people to crime because they have to feed their children. They have to fill their stomach. If they cannot get a support channel, they are to get food some, somehow. At the same time, the super rich also suffer because they don't know what to do with all the money. They're poor with life. So they try addict, try drugs, illegal drugs, got, got addicted. They try to explore people sexually abuse their power. So they also suffer because they, they mess up their lives. Secondly, they accelerate the change. 4G, 5G, life becomes faster and faster, and robots take over. Our brain it is, our brain is not wired for all the changes. Darwin says that the strongest species are the ones that are most adaptive to change. But now the change is getting so fast. For example, I consider myself I consider myself retarded because I can't handle all this technological change. I depend on my young assistant. So many people they're not able to cope with all the technological changes. 
Get faster and faster and faster. For what? So you have a big moment, eh? Also, can survive only at, at a much more slower pace to keep in touch with nature, to keep in touch with each other, to keep in touch with our own soul. Our mental health depends on a much slower rate of change. The third thing is secular, secularization and materialism. We do not need God. They declare God's dead. Look how rich we are. We're creating things, we're buying things. Why remove God from our life? That is the beginning of the end. Firstly, urbanization. Do you know what it's like? Like, love you to be like you to have community, a little village, a neighborhood. People eat together, visit each other. And now we're all living in a condo, a little pigeon hole. We, we don't know who lives next door, we don't talk to next door. So loneliness becomes an epidemic. Many people suffer from loneliness. Lastly, the unraveling of, of the family. And family is the basic unit of society. When we have a healthy family, we have a healthy society. Now, so many people, children, grew up in one family household. Many of the mass murderers come from a family without a father, without a male role model. So we pay a heavy price for the progress we make. We need to slow down and smell, smell the roses. So that's why I say that maybe the pandemic is wake us up. The, the good news is that the darkest moment of trouble and pain force us to search for different ways or true answers to our mental health problem. This, this was true 10 years ago, 20 years ago, was got back, back. It's even more true today. We do really need to find better ways to make, so, make our society healthier. So it's not just individual job, it's collectively, we all need to do something. Here is, a, is part of my answer that we really need to find ways and means to reduce suffering on one hand, or to prepare people how to be tough enough and wise enough to live with suffering. So part of the mental health problem is that people are so overprotected. They elect, they elect the, the flowers growing up in a greenhouse. A, a little rain, a little rain, they collapse. We need to have prepared people to be much more tougher, courageous, and more adaptive. Now, here, here is a, a simple answer. We often tell my kind. I say that now you're in trouble, you're miserable. Do you know why? Because some of the basic things for mental health you don't have. The body needs food and water and air. Your mind, your spirit, need 
God, the other love, and need hope, faith, love, hope. Hope that you do something to create a better future. Love means connected with your neighborhood, with your family, with friends. Faith means that believe that, that God can guide us. And they, um, God, they, <coughs> there are several uh, organizations are dedicated to revive spirituality and religious faith in your society because I cannot go through each day. I cannot go through a single day without spending at least an hour in prayer. I don't know how can people go through life without faith. So I tell my, I help my client to find a face, to find the grounds for new hope, and find way, find new pattern of relating to connect with people. If they have these three things, they don't need medic. They don't need the medicine to 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 keep them happy or calm. And another thing I emphasize is the. You need to have courage to face life. You need to learn how to accept what cannot be changed. The wisdom. You need to learn how to transcend and transform the suffering. So with, with the golden triangle, with the iron triangle, you can face many, many of life's problems with a full of heart, with a, with a going to see a psychiatrist. Of course, the government has to do their part to make society more just, more fair, offer more opportunity to the minorities and to the immigrants and to the poor people. So that's why I think that we need to raise its Franco's contribution is that he restore the soul to mental therapy. I am carrying on his same vision that we need to really care for your soul. Find just here some way to care for your soul. And finally, you cannot have mental health without affirming some of the basic values. You know, the valuation of life is a key. To, to survive and to live. Hope, faith, faith in, in the basic intrinsic value of life, and to hope that tomorrow better, to live with purpose. You know, all these basic core values can keep it healthy. So we hope that, uh, that in our discussion, in our dialogue about how to create a, a healthier, society, happier society. Now, these are some of the things that we can we can talk about. So I think my time is up. I I, I welcome all the experts in this uh, panel to get, shed more light on this problem. Thank you for, for listening. Well, and thank you, Paul, for clearly laying out the problem um, and taking the first stab at it. Um, at this point, I feel like your golden and iron triangles are pretty much a classic, you know, of um, Dr. Wong. So um, next up, we have Kirk J. Schneider of Saybrook University. You have 10 minutes. Thank you so much. And thank you, Paul, in particular, for the honor of this invitation. I. Uh, I wanted to put up a PowerPoint slide here. So let's, let's hope that this works. It'll just take me a moment, hopefully. Uh, let's see, okay. We're just about there. Okay, I, I'm gonna be echoing a lot of uh, Paul's comments, opening comments here. 
I'd like to focus specifically on what I, what I call emotionally impoverished relationships. I really see this as the, the major uh, psychosocial crisis in our country and certainly in parts of the world. What I mean here is emotionally stunted relationships, relationships that uh, make people feel small and insignificant. And uh, as part of my uh, presidential campaign, actually, uh, this, this problem really is at, at the core of all of my platforms. They all converge on, on this, uh, you know, major debacle. So first, I, I would call for a WPA, that is uh, Works Progress Administration style funding for a number of the platforms I'm about to talk about. Um, I, I really think we need that kind of mobilization to deal with the issue. Now, where, first of all, where do we see emotionally impoverished relationships? Well, I think we see them cross-sectionally throughout the country, uh, regardless of class, of uh, race, of political ideology, and so on. And I believe that a lot of the problems uh, stem from uh, current challenges that we face. Uh, one of them certainly is the pandemic, which has made people feel a great deal of isolation. And by the way, I'm, I'm speaking about emotionally impoverished relationships to oneself as well as to others. Uh, so the pandemic has uh, made it very difficult uh, for people to feel uh, more of a closeness certainly with, with others. Um, but uh, also I think it's challenged a lot of people to be in solitude. Uh, whereas before, maybe they had a lot more distractions. And, uh, and that's, that's a, that can be a significant problem, uh, not relating to oneself in a very aligned way. But certainly economic stress and dislocation, uh, racial, racial and class degradation, and the whole quick fix instant results model of our society much of our socioeconomic system runs on that. And, and uh, again, the, the issue of high tech, of relying so much on our devices, you know, how much is that keeping us from uh, growing and uh, struggling with person-to-person -person contact? So I believe all of this uh, leads to a great deal of a uh, sense of helplessness, what I would call groundlessness. Terror management theorists call it death anxiety, uh, which leads to a number of the problems that I just mentioned, including uh, anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, and uh, many overcompensations for that that we see in, in our culture collectively uh, in the forms of uh, political extremism, uh, racial extremism, uh, what, what I have called the, the polarized mind, which is a fear-driven need to fixate on a single point of view to the utter exclusion of competing points of view. And I really see this as the, the bane of uh, societies throughout history. I don't have time to go into detail about that, but we never seem to learn about addressing the polarized mind and addre basically addressing uh, fear. And, uh, and at, at its core, the, the fear of of insignificance, of not counting in our society. So there's a, a great need for a cultural intervention, as I see it. And in particular, to, to bring uh, in 
a longer term emotionally reparative relationships, both to the mental health area and to our organizations. But in particular, in regions of the country that are underserved, that are marginalized and, and feel extremely estranged from the, the mainstream of the culture. Uh, so uh, I, one of my uh, platforms in the presidential campaign is to call for in-depth, emotionally reparative therapeutic relationships to be much more available across many sectors of our country. Again, based on a WPA style mobilization of funding, uh, but in particular in the underserved and mar marginalized areas of the country. I'm acknowledging that uh, cognitive and uh, neuroscientific uh, based uh, support for people is uh, extremely helpful, but uh, you know the pendulum has really swung too far in it. I think what we're missing much more at a core level are these psychodynamic and existential and somatically and spiritually oriented uh, therapies that can really address people more at that emotional embodied level. And that they're, they're not so much about uh, you know, changing behaviors or into, into intellectual points of view, much more about creating a condition of um, support, of presence, fuller presence to, to oneself and toward and with others. So this is what I call the need for a core of depth healers. Uh, a, a massive mobilization that I believe many of us in the mental health field are tailor-made to, uh, to join in with. And uh, again, to, to go through the platforms that converge on emotionally impoverished relationships, the need for healing dialogues, which I've been involved with for 15 years or more, and most recently with Braver Angels, which is a citizens movement that brings liberals and conservatives together for highly structured supportive dialogues. But uh, I've, I've been uh, fostering this approach with what I call the experiential democracy dialogue, which is bringing people of highly contrasting backgrounds together for more intimate one-on-one -on -one humanizing dialogues. Uh, to provide the quality uh, that is in-depth, emotionally reparative, mental health care and organizational functioning that I talked, out, talked about before. And finally, I call for a task force to look into the creation of a federal office of uh, psychological consultants, distinguished experts in particularly psychosocial approaches to mental health care and organizational functioning to be available 24 seven within the government to advise the executive branch, that is the president and his team or her team, uh, the Congress and the public on ways to address the psychosocial crises of our country. Er, and also, uh, you have just under one minute. Okay, thanks very much. So also I, I see this position, this office, uh, as, as uh, a spearhead to, to take a leadership role in promoting healing dialogues throughout the country, in uh, acquiring funding, the WPA style funding that I was talking about before, for such, uh, such programs. Uh, also to, um, to take the lead in, in promoting uh, uh, more the emotionally reparative, uh, longer term uh, relationships, therapeutic relationships in underserved communities as well. Now, I don't see this, uh, this office as 
you know, taking away from what APA is doing with their advocacy efforts with the government and with the public. But I really strongly see it as amplifying those efforts, similar to what the Surgeon General has been doing for the AMA. So we can very much work in coordination with the APA to, uh, you know, to bolster, to inform this office. But again, it would be totally focused on psychosocial interventions and uh, be available 24 seven to, to advise uh, the public and uh, the Congress. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kirk, for your presentation and for informing us about the issue of emotionally impoverished relationships and also bring to attention the uh, Braver Angels movement. All right, so up next we have Farouk Nareem of University of Toronto. Thank you. First of all, I really feel privileged uh, to be here and, uh, and I'm learning actually a lot from this conference. I must admit, and I'm not going to use any PowerPoint, you know, I'm just, uh, and I'm not going to, you know, talk for 10 minutes, I'll give you more time. So uh, I, I have to admit that I didn't really think about these things until seven, eight years ago. And, and I'll start with this submission uh, that like many other academics, we don't really think of all these kind of things, you know, when until unless, you know, you, uh, uh, it's either mentoring or something goes wrong. So I remember five, six years ago when I had, uh, uh, I was diagnosed with diabetes and that was mainly because of the stressful lifestyle I had. And, um, and then, you know, I had a bit of a shock. Oh my God, you know, why me? Why me? You know, the kind of normal things that you, when something goes wrong with you, you think, oh my God, why is this me? Because I don't have any family history of diabetes. I'm not even overweight. Oh, okay. What have I done to deserve this thing? And, um, and after six months, I totally kind of, uh, you know, started taking my medication, changed my lifestyle. First time in my life, actually, I started, sleeping at 11 or 12 o'clock and had seven, eight solid hours, you know, uh, of sleep. Uh, I started having breakfast for the first time in my life. And uh, 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 because when you are so much focused on the race to succeed, you know, you don't think about these things. You just kind of have that because... Uh, uh, Dr. Wong said this thing really, so it's really amazing and it really called to me. You said the purpose can be two-edged sword, right? Yes, it can be two-edged sword because I had a purpose, you know, a greater meaning, et cetera, et cetera, but it was just really to win the race. But I did win the race, you know, I, I completed my PhD in 2010 and I think I became a professor in 2016. 15, 16, or whatever, right? So I didn't win the race really quickly, but all these kind of things happened that changed my perspective on things. And once, you know, I was able to do all these things, for the first time in my life, I saw something miserable in a positive kind of way, it was a change of perspective. And I said to myself, well, thank you, diabetes, because it's because of diabetes, I first time in my life, I thought about all these things that I would have never thought about. So I think this is the most important thing I have learned in my life that, you know, you, how you can actually look at things which totally change your perspective if you are, if you just kind of focus on, uh, on, on, on the feelings of, of gratitude, on, on being grateful for whatever you have, because I thought, right, okay, you know, it could be worse. I, I could actually be undiagnosed and one day, you know, boom, you, you go because of the complications, right? So I thought, uh, and, I, <laughs> and some of my friends actually said to me, no, oh, that's silly, you know, why do you think, thank you, diabetes? I said, no, it's because of this problem, it gave me so much insight into life. I uh, became interested in Sufism, uh, which I'm sure you know, uh, most of you are familiar. Uh, I became interested in Sufism in 2006, seven when I started my work on CBT and culture. Uh, 
but I never practiced it. You know, it was more like a theoretical concept. I was reading and everything. And, uh, and for the first time I started meditating. Uh, and you know what the interesting thing was, you know, becoming more aware of myself, becoming more aware of myself. I realized, I thought I have great coping skills and I'm so good at managing stress, et cetera, et cetera. And I started meditation, I started Sufism and the mindfulness. Actually, I realized I am a very, I was a very stressed man. I had all the kind of, you know, the beating heart and all the kind of stuff. The point is, we can actually learn if we are blessed. So that's another thing I'm kind of realizing. It's also, you know, there has to be some kind of blessing that kind of helps you. But you see, the problem is we're living in the age of distraction, aren't we? You know, if you go to a restaurant, you see two young, uh, a young couple, uh, you know, sitting in a nice, lovely restaurant, looking very romantic, texting each other on their smartphones. We, we don't even... We don't even build our relationships, you know, and I think um, that is kind of um, or something relevant, There's something relevant. I think we're living in this age of distraction and we are, uh, we are not really prepared for that. Okay, I mean, COVID is something, it has come, it'll, be, it'll go. What we're not prepared for is this age of distraction that we are entering. We are I, I see that in, in, 10, in 20 years, you know, the obesity will be a huge problem because people are not moving because of, you know, we get everything at home. We, especially in the COVID, that's one thing we learn. We can get everything at home. We can even work from home. It's great. Uh, we also not really nurturing our relationships like Dr. Schneider said. We are not really into, we're not relationship focused anymore. Uh, I, I, I was looking at um, a, 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 a piece of research recently, and they said actually young people are more interested in, in um, uh, uh, watching a porn website rather than uh, a relationship because relationship is very hard work. And that's right, isn't it? Relationships are difficult. Relationships are very hard working. Uh, you, you, sorry, you, 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 they consume a lot of energy. So we're not, we know, you know, we are going in the direction where we're not really, we don't want to work hard because we get everything, you know, you get everything with your, uh, on your smartphone. Uh, and I'm not saying smartphones are bad, you know, I'm all for technology. I am actually, uh, uh, that's one of my areas of interest my, and in research and everything. The point is, when do we get some kind of moderation? When do we focus on relationships and use the technology to help us rather than technology becoming the focus of our, our life? The last thing I want to say, um, I, I was very young when I read this story by, uh, by um, uh, Mark Twain. And uh, the story was about um, Mark Twain goes to the small village and there he, um, he for, for a fishing hol holiday, for, so they're there for two weeks and this young boy helps him. And after two weeks, he says to the kid, why don't you come with me to New York and I'll, um, I'll help you, you know, I'll, I said, well, what, like how? He said, you know, I'll send you to school and what will happen after that? He said, then I'll send you to a nice college and then to university. And he said, after that, and after that, and after that. And uh, Mark Twain says, well, you know, then you'll become a rich and famous man like me. And he said, well, what will happen after that? And he said, well, then you can come to this village and, you know, you can have a great fishing holiday. And the kid said, well, that's what I'm already doing, isn't it? So I, <laughs> so I think very, very important thing, really. We work, you know, we hear all these people who want to work 24-7 so that they retire early or they want to succeed or compete or whatever. Uh, especially, you know, people who want to retire early. So they work so much. I don't have any idea why they can't work less. So they can carry on at a retired later age, uh, but so just life. So anyway, thank you for listening to my random thoughts. I hope I didn't bore you too much. Uh, 
grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Well, thank you, Farouk. And um, thanks for sharing your personal story and echoing Wong and Frankel and talk about how suffering can be a blessing sometimes and also the importance of relationships. All right. So next up is Brent Dean Robbins of Point Park University. Okay. Well, again, thank you for the invitation, uh, Paul. It's great to be here and to see uh, to see some of you I know and some of you I'm meeting for the first time. Uh, so just great to be here and, and it's an honor. So uh, I'm going to talk about joy, uh, which is something I've been studying for a long time and only recently began thinking about it in relationship to a pandemic because suddenly we've been thrust into this situation. And I've been thinking about research that I've been, you know, studying something I've been studying about for a long time and thinking about how it can inform ways that people can cope with the circumstances of their lives in the current situation. So I want to talk a little bit about that. St studying joy, uh, you know, started way back in graduate school when I was a master's student, and uh, I just decided I, I I was wanted to study joy because I had a client. It was actually one of the first clients I saw in therapy, and I was doing an intake interview, and I asked her, you know, why she came to therapy, and she said because she doesn't have any joy in her life. And I remember that really struck me because that wasn't in the DSM, you know, like joy deficit disorder, you know, it's not, it was not a diagnostic category. So I went to my supervisor and I said, well, what do we do about this? You know, her, her, uh, her goal is to have more joy in life. And he said, well, that's really interesting. I don't know. You know, we both laughed. And, uh, and I said, okay, well, I'll go do some research on it and see, what, see what's in the library. And of course, there was very little to nothing on joy in the research literature. There was some stuff, but it was usually like basic emotion type of research, momentary states. But I think she was talking about more of a joyful trait or a joyful disposition. So I decided I was going to do my dissertation on that. So that was a long time ago. That was 1998. And I remember being in the halls at Duquesne University and my professor, Paul Richer, who's now retired, yelling down the hall, have you read the New York Times? And I said, no, I haven't read the New York Times. And he said, Marty Seligman's in the New York Times. And I said, who's Marty Seligman? Because I didn't know who he was at that time. And he said, uh, he said, just read, the, go look at the New York Times. So I looked at the New York Times on the headline was, you know, psychologist says there needs to be more research on joy. You know, so that was the beginning of the positive psychology movement. And it was the year that Seligman was uh, the uh, president of APA. So I, that gave me some relief because I thought I was a little bit nervous about studying joy because it, even it's still kind of stigmatized. You know, people think it's kind of a frivolous subject matter. I, people would ask me what I was studying for my dissertation and I would say joy and they would sort of giggle, you know, a little bit, <laughs> you know, like, and you expect to get tenure, you know, studying joy, you know, that, that kind of response. And uh, so I, that gave me some relief that I was on to something that the president of APA was sort of... Uh, saying in the New York Times that we need to study this this subject matter. So I, I pressed on and I did qualitative uh, dissertation research using a phenomenological method and I studied state joy. I studied the experience of the state of joy and I'll, I'll just describe very briefly what that what that looked like when I studied it. So people when they when I asked them to describe this experience they talked about a felt movement up and out of the body a sense of appreciation uh, for that experience, a sense of peace and security, a felt sense of being centered and balanced, a warm, powerful, energized feeling moving upward and out of the body toward the world. In many ways, the feeling was mirroring a kind of self-transcendence, almost a forgetting of the self, uh, losing us the self in the moment. Uh, there's a feeling of being more connected feeling closer or more intimate with others who were present. Not always someone present, but feeling connected when they were there. A non-instrumental mode of being. I've, I struggled to find the language for this, but it seemed like they weren't trying to get somewhere outside of the experience to the next thing. They were completely absorbed in the experience itself, and this was connected to a transformation in their perception and their experience of time. So there's an altered sense of time and space, a profound sense of being present in the moment, and a feeling of being nurtured and a sense of having grown from that experience. So based on that, I 
I, uh, I continued to study state joy for a while, and then I realized that what I was really interested in, though, was not just these momentary, transitory experiences of joy. Uh, the people can certainly pursue uh, emotional states, but you know, emotional states come and go. Moods can last, can linger for a day or two, maybe. Uh, but I was more interested in a disposition or a trait. And so uh, I began to study trait joy. And I used a phenomenological method additionally to do that with the intention to develop a, a scaling instrument based on that phenomenological research. So then I started to find a lot of themes that were that were relevant to some of the positive psychology out there but also some of the research in existential and the humanistic tradition and a lot of the things that Paul said at the beginning of this talk mirror the very sorts of themes that were very strong in a lot of the qualitative research on uh, what I call the joyful life. So I had people describe what it was like to live a joyful life and they described they started their narrative descriptions talking about a state of brokenness. So very similar to Dr. Naeem, where he talks about discovering, did I pronounce your name right, <laughs> by the way? Okay. Uh, that, um, oh, good. Uh, that, you know, being in a state of brokenness, like discovering you have diabetes, or, uh, in, or in some cases, people described very horrible things like uh, somebody's father dying or in another case uh, somebody who wasn't accepted by their parents because they were gay or in a third in, in another case somebody what talked about uh, feeling very alienated their first year their freshman year at school and feeling very homesick so there's all these different experiences of feeling deprived feeling broken and they felt like they lacked a sense of wholeness or completion and that they really didn't feel very close to a state of happiness at all. Uh, but they were grounded in these experiences. They were not defensive or evasive or avoidant of their suffering. Uh, these experiences of suffering and tragedy grounded them, gave them a sense of humility, and then a calling to realize a more meaningful project that was valued and viewed as intrinsically good. And then the participants described being centered in an interpersonal or communal context through which they were encouraged, both empowered and inspired to achieve their calling. So I see the connection to what Paul calls, you know, in the, the, the agopic triangle, you know, the, the love piece of agape here. And what uh, Kirk is emphasizing as being the uh, importance of relationships. And then there's a transformation into a joyful life that was identified as an experience of breaking open where they were they, where they perceived they were fulfilling an important mission or project and that this perception was accompanied by a state of emotion that was joyful so there was an emotional state that was transformative and then the feeling was characterized again by an intense warm powerful radiating bursting open of the heart in the center of their being and this feeling of joy was experienced as being uplifted a light and almost weightless lifting of burdens in a sense of highness and jubilation and then this feeling also involved the transformation in the perception of time and space like we saw in the other research on state joy and this experience was described as having a sense of touching on a transcendent dimension beyond time and space something enduring in which a vivid moment of joy and personal transformation would continue to pervade their experience into the indefinite future. So there's an interesting fusion between a kind of state joy, but where this kind of state transformative moment becomes part of the background of their experience, almost like a pervasive mood that conditions their life from that point forward. Uh, and then they describe these profoundly existentially grounded experiences of state joy as involving a, a appreciation for the mystery of being, which was punctuated by feelings of awe, reverence, and gratitude, or a sense of the sacred. And then participants described a feeling of gratitude for the moment of joy, which they felt was a gift of grace or blessing that was granted and accepted. Brent, uh, just one more minute. One more minute? Okay. Yep. So having felt this transformation of their existence toward a transcendent dimension, 
beyond their everyday existence. They had the sense that their existence had undergone profound and lasting transformation, and, uh, and it would come to permeate the background of their experience from that moment forward. Uh, they talk about a sense of opening up and out toward the transcendent, toward other people, valued aspirations, as well as toward a transcendent spiritual or existential dimension to existence to which their life would become newly ordered. And this breaking open of the self and the feeling of warmth, moving up and outward from the body, was felt as a boundless fecundity that called to be generously shared. Again, the communal piece there. And in sharing that joy, the participants believed they were deeply connected to otherness through a sense of togetherness and community, and they were left with a feeling of solidarity and love that was given in their sense of oneness with others. So based on that, uh, we've begun to develop a scaling instrument called the Joyful Life Scale, and uh, the items on that uh, are trying to get at this more unconditional joy, that's, that's a, a sense of joyfulness despite the circumstances of one's life. And we've done initial study with 235 participants, and we found that uh, this it has pretty good inter-item reliability, 0.92 chrome box alpha, nine item scale. Uh, it's correlated with big five inventory subscales, extroversion, agreeableness, positively, neuroticism, negatively. Uh, linked to uh, correlated moderately with a lot of other measures of uh, well-being but distinct mm -hmm. and then also relevant to some of Paul's comments positively uh, related to religious belief so those who had religious belief scored higher in the joyful life compared to those who did not and then we're now collecting data and some of the preliminary findings are that on a cold presser task which is a measurement of pain we uh, the, the blood pressure uh, those who had a higher joyful life scale had a smaller change in blood pressure between the beginning and the end of the cold presser task. So those are a few few of our findings on some of the quantitative research. And that's all. all right. Very cool. It's hard to get all that in 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, no worries. No worries. You fit it all in. All right. So thanks for sharing with us your research on joy and the joyful life. And also congratulations on your latest publication. So, uh, <laughs> well, that's all good. So the last but not least, we have Martin Wong of the Chinese University of Hong Kong, who's going to be sharing a PowerPoint with us. Yes. Okay, let me share the screen. Uh, once again, thank you very much, uh, Paul, for the very kind invitation. Uh, and also team for your um, arrangement as well. So uh, in the subsequent 10 minutes, I'm trying to put our focus uh, on Asia and what has been happening. And I'm seeing things from a uh, doctor's point of view. I've become very disappointed on the recent mental health status in Asia, but perhaps not really just restricted to Asia, but our clinical practice. Um, People are becoming very, very, really very worried about the rising trend uh, and uh, of incidents of, of mortality even from depression and a number of mental health illnesses. So because for the mental health condition, we understand it is it remains to be a leading global burden of healthcare in Asia. But however, in our clinical practice, how even we're very close to a patient and be friends with them, um, probably their problems have been neglected and uh, before their clinical manifestations become really apparent. So there are some very common reasons of neglect, including self-stigmatization. I mean, in Western countries, it may be better, but in Asia, in Hong Kong, a number of, of uh, relatively uh, traditional um, uh, countries with traditional Chinese beliefs, self-stigmatization as well as embarrassment, inadequate manpower and accessibility with limited insurance are just really some of the very important issues related to mental health. Uh, because of its low awareness and discovery of the mental health problems at only a very late stage, we do have concerns because its impact on society is very substantial. Because I'm also a public health practitioner, 
I'm really also quite worried about its growing concern on influences on economics, productivity, job absenteeism, and turnover. So this is actually what has been written in the uh, conference book, talking about the major challenges and potential strategies, and hope we can have some sort of conclusions on what we've been doing and also discussing, which shall be worthwhile to have a rethink of uh, the global health strategies on mental health. So uh, globally, we understand in Asia, especially important are depression and anxiety, which I have to say that is uh, in fact growing, not only in a community, but in my, in my clinic especially in post-COVID-19 era, uh, where there are a number of people will need to increase their medications, increase dosages, um, increase frequency of counseling, and exhibit, well, many of them exhibit suicidal ideation and also behavior. So therefore, there's been increase in burden. This graph is really just to show that the prevalence of mental problems and the incidents and the disability adjusted life years and the year life loss have been increasing very drastically over the past one or one and a half decades. And then, uh, however, we do have a very serious concern that the accessibility uh, to mental health um, uh, facilities and professionals has been very, very limited. Only less than 20% of people have adequate access to mental health treatment, and the loss of productivity is especially very remarkable. One thing we would like to really um, share is that medical doctors are taught that we should give a patient with mental disorder for at least 45 minutes in the first consultation. But have a look in many Asian countries, because we've got lots of patients and for a few doctors, our consultations are really talking about five minutes. And then we, after we review the medication, we only ask one question. Do you have any discomfort or suicidal idea? No, and then goodbye. This is what we can really do. And I do think we, we need to really think about uh, the subsequent um, service uh, uh, improvement in order to better treat the impact of mental health, like depression causing difficulty managing those conditions, quality of life being impairment, impaired, and there have been worsening symptoms and even even to em emerging psychiatric symptoms, and we do suffer from physical health problems. So the biopsychosocial experts are actually very well known that it can actually affect individual life in various aspects. And then the, a very typical example is a patient suffering from depression and subsequently lost his or her job with psychology impacts and become even more depressed. Because now we know from medicine that depression can cause diabetes it, and can cause cardiovascular disease per se. It's not just an associated factor, it's a causative factor. And also there are a lot of social impacts because of social withdrawal. And of course, it's needless to say, this slide is really just to show the magnitude of the total economic burden of depression and uh, suicide in, say, Japan is around 11 million billion US dollars in the late 2000s and early 2010, including burden due to uh, direct mental health care, depression-related care services, and work stress. And needless to say, healthcare utilization becomes a big problem then with the now COVID-19 pandemic still with us in some countries. Uh, our medical doctors are really so busy. And uh, well, guess what? If we're going to refer a patient to clinical psychologist, they need to probably wait for two full years before they receive their first consultation. And uh, there are a lot of barriers to enhance mental health as well. Not all of which we've been talking about stigmatization, family involvement, where uh, we need family members to understand psychiatric patients' problems, accessibility and resources are problems as well. So there are a number, a lot of reasons for stigmatization, and especially so in Asian countries because of insufficient knowledge and also historical issues. And there are a number of examples of stigmatization, which withhold a person's uh, desire 
to seek medical help for their mental health problems. So therefore, they feel very ashamed to seek help and receive consultations and less likely to seek help and keep receiving mental health services. And there have been lack of knowledge and fear of prejudice. So people are very afraid to seek help from their family members as well. They don't really wish to tell the uh, others saying that they've got depressed mood and symptoms. And accessibility is actually a very important problem on its own because not everyone can get access to mental health services. It's not available in all parts of countries and we may have difficulties in assessing uh, uh, services, especially in low and income, uh, low uh, and middle income countries as well. So inadequate resources, but then I think perhaps when we are talking about enhancing mental health, there are three, at least three important points where healthcare policy workers and also clinical practitioner, practitioners and professionals like you as a psychologist could probably address like mental health literacy, policy and screening for depression, which uh, are very rarely done in Asian countries and enhancing accessibility which could then be very important. When we talk about enhancing mental health literacy, we understand better mental health literacy, which uh, will enable people to seek help even earlier and identify signs of mental disorders using whole community com campaigns and community activities aimed at specific target audiences. And then, of course, we have to think about expansion of primary care and development developing reliable screening tools, as well as improving policies in terms of regular monitoring and management of people with mental problems and at the initial stage. So now we've got technology to increase accessibility, including self-help health app, self-management, and also community-based outreach and engagement programs, which could be one of the innovative ways to improve mental health. So, All right, Martin, think, just uh, under a minute, just under right, a minute. Okay. Yep. Thank you. I'll finish within that. So intersectoral collaboration is very important. I really wish to uh, express my appreciation to the New Zealand Mental Health Program, which is a five-year plan to increase services for mental health and addiction. It aims to increase mental health and addiction services in a number, number of areas, like na national consistency of access, service quality improvement and outcomes performance. So there are major efforts in a number of areas, including social inclusions, enhancing current services accessibility and quality, and also new initiative to prevent mental health problems before it's too late, and also provision of various supports and education program. So we can see from this slide that there are major achievements and outcomes from this community-based program, which involve, involves various stakeholders. So my last slide is really just to bring out a message that although I'm not a psychologist, I don't have training in this area. I, I, I think doctors will need to learn from psychologists' professions, and we really hope we can collaborate not only in clinics and hospitals, but also in the community as well. So that's my few cents. I have to thank once again, Paul, and also team for this opportunity to share a little bit of um, our experience here. And thanks so much once again, and hope we can actually discuss this issue later, uh, well, productively. Thank you very much. All right. Yes, no worries. And thank you, Martin, for joining us. And we look forward to this collaboration. And yes, um, okay, so Paul now has three minutes to maybe wrap this up and... Okay, three minutes, okay. Now it's very clear from this panel that our mental health system based on the medical model is broken. It's too costly, not easily accessible. Uh, the first point. The second point is very clear that we need to do something at all levels. I wish that, uh, that my friend Kirk can become APA president so that he can have as much influence as Silliman to change the paradigm. Because uh, we, we, we do need change at the upper level. Uh, 
the change very important because why? Because if we have starts think about medicine, 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 start thinking existential psychology, that will make all the difference. So some of my friends are successful, but they complain about being miserable. They want to have joy and happiness, like, uh, like my friend uh, Brian mentioned. They, they can't, medicine can teach them that. They need to learn from existential psychology that you can transform sorrow into joy. Like, uh, like my friend Pharaoh, it comes in name. Look, here's a case, it demonstrates that bad things in life are just as important for your happiness and the health as good things. Wow, you did learn that. They don't need to go to the hospital anymore. Lastly, the last minute, even though technology is a problem, technology cannot solve a problem, but in the right hand, they can be a blessing. So my vision, here's my vision, same as the, my new friend, Martin Wong, see, we are, we are both wrong. <laughs> my vision is that if we properly use technology, there should not be any lonely pe people in the world. There should not be any depressed people in the world. Because we have developed powerful apps that can make people connect with each other, and if you learn the basic essential competency, life skill, to cope with life's problems, they need to wait until I get an appointment. So, but, but I don't have this, I'm too old, I need to recruit young people to help me to develop those apps, and mental health app that Dean, Dean mentioned earlier. That can solve a lot of the problem. Thank you, Mr. Means up. bye. <laughs> All right. Thank you, panelists, for sharing with us the importance of uh, expanding the medical model. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending the session. For all the questions that haven't been answered yet, we will collect them. Hopefully, the panelists could answer them later. Stay with us for the next session, which will be a long-awaited awards ceremony. This will include the Lifetime Achievement Awards as well as the Scholarship Awards. Please join us in celebrating the work that others have done to advance psychology as a whole. Hope to see you there. Bye for now. Bye, thank you very much. Say it's never too late to start again. What breaks your heart?